it, it's such an elaborate topic and you have given us 35 minutes to complete it 45 were also very less actually but we'll try our best to see whatever best we can do so thank thank you very much aditya and team equalify for this initiative and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to interact with such esteemed panelists uh, as you are right aditya investors worldwide are sharpening their focus on sustainability climate change and governance the increasing bouquet of esg focused funds worldwide is a testimony to this it is not only a matter of time before esg considerations will become the threshold for investing actually many are saying esg is the future of investing in fact indian companies are also looking to raise their sustainability quotient especially after the covid-19 pandemic and a number of cl climate related and governance incidences which we have seen companies are now seeking independent assessments and esg performance benchmarks in fact we are hearing the term net zero uh, a lot these days and experts say that uh, net zero must be achieved by 2050 so uh, and to be discussing on this uh, topic i don't think i would have actually got a better panel where uh, uh, shailesh ji was uh, is coming from the industry background and giving the industry perspective and then akanksha is there from the corporate perspective side of it uh thara comes with the platform perspective and ultimately govind comes from the fund perspective so i think it overall covers the overall panel i just i am just missing one person from the government to come here sit in this panel and we actually just make policies about it so uh now uh, what my first question will go to you akansha is as the esg practitioner please tell us how are esg ratings calculated and how is it a measure of a firm's credentials sure uh, firstly thank you ajay for having me here it's truly a pleasure so rating agencies essentially calculate esg scores based on the corporate disclosures available in the public domain and due to this variation in the depth and access to data as well as the difference in focus of different rating agencies the global esg landscape remains highly fragmented and lacks cohesion in fact different rating methodologies often tell different stories about the same organization so presently there are few esg rating regimes that are published by reputed agencies like uh, and these are globally accepted as industry benchmarks some of them are like msci uh, bloomberg robeco sam and they all pursue different methodologies for arriving at an organization's esg rating for instance like msci's risk rating model it tries to find out what are the most prominent risk and opportunities facing the company and its industry and how exposed is the organization to these factors how well are the business operations managed in this context and all that but bloomberg's esg rating on the other hand are not based on the actual esg performance of companies but on their degree of sustainability information and disclosures so the rating model is based on the information extracted from annual reports sustainability reports and all of that and the, 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 that's where i feel that esg ratings go beyond balance sheet analysis presenting a more comprehensive estimation of a company's credentials and they consider factors that might not overly financial connotations but are indispensable for risk mitigation perspective uh just to answer this and uh, studies have proved that uh, companies which are focused more on esg have outperformed companies that do not so there are enough evidences we have in the market uh now to demonstrate how important is the role of these ratings however we definitely need more standardization on these ratings across the industry you are unmuted ajay thanks akanksha it was uh, very insightful my uh second question uh, is for you thara uh, what are the different sustainable investment types and how are they being received by the investor community so far so talking to an a very exclusive investor community probably i can very safely assume that all of you have seen media reports and market indices where we are seeing that esg investments are consistently outperforming their peers we probably may not be able to very conclusively say that all of these are actually flowing into sustainable businesses 
we won't even be able to say that you know these are very calculated investment decisions and very systematic process behind it in these decisions but what we can very confidently say is that the messaging is consistent across the globe and the numbers are growing you know in 2020 overall globally 35 trillion has for have flown into sustainable investments and if you look behind that there are some kind of a pattern and themes that are coming out as to what could have been the strategy behind them and some of them are more prominent than the others and the most widely used strategy is esg integration which is nothing but an investor considers the environmental social and governance factors also into the financial analysis of the fund's business case the second most widely used is negative exclusion which is very easy and which also gives you the more opportunity to invest to right and um, i don't um, uh, just don't invest into businesses which are very obviously not sustainable like your tobacco and alcohols and weapon and the third most widely used is uh, something that uh, they call it as a stakeholder engagement where the investor goes one step more and then engage to take the accountability to actually engage the the investee company to influence their behavior towards sustainable practices and performance even collaborate with them to achieve some of these and these are the most pro prominently used but then uh, i would always think that there is one very effective methodology which is probably the least leveraged or that, that's the impact investment wherein the investor or the fund is actually committing to make measurable specific actual outcomes out of an investment the reason why this is not probably not very um, uh, utilized could be that number one lack of sufficient opportunities where this is bundled for the investor community to adopt and number two probably the impact measurement and management methods and the frameworks are still at its nascency stage and if you look at india the trends are same i mean the last two years probably the investments have grown up by five times and by uh, absolute numbers the number is still very small it's just 13000 crores which is less than one percentage of our aum but it may be too early and too less for us to say that this is the definite strategy that india funds are utilizing however broadly i would say that they fall into two categories one is the best in class positive inclusion which is just go and pick up the least risky items right like uh, esg nifty 100 it is based on it goes and picks up the most sustainable business from the most sustainable sector let's say infosys and tcs from it or access and sbi from financial and the other strategy is as we said the esg inclusion i think it will build a couple of more years to see you know to really creatively explore into these strategies in india and decide what is right for india thank you very much thara it was very insightful uh, shailesh ji very good evening and good welcome evening. to the panel thank you so, shailesh ji just before you joined we were talking about we are hearing uh, uh, a lot about net zero these days and experts are saying that we have to reach a net zero by 2050 so uh, i wanted to ask you about your vision that uh, how do you see how will the world look like in 2050 at net zero fantastic question uh, ajay uh, i'm going to give a uh, a purely personal viewpoint uh so i would see three things in 2050 one i would experience far cleaner air that we can breathe in and the reason why i am confident that will happen is because the first things that will get eliminated are particulate matter which clog our lungs and which really make the air we breathe so unhealthy and therefore i i think the attack of the world in terms of actions esg actions or e actions are on getting rid of this particulate matter case in point fly ash from burning coal and there are all sorts of strategies which are being worked out to make sure that doesn't go up into the atmosphere the second thing i can sense is that we will the whole population of planet earth would have access to clean water from a tap and while it may seem like such a small accomplishment it is actually a huge thing that needs to be done over the next 
30 years or 28 years that I've left because there is so much to be done in terms of infrastructure, in terms of pipelines, in terms of supply, cleanliness, making sure it's portable, making sure it is, uh, it's available for that particular use in that particular manner. And the third big picture thing I will talk about is extremely narrowed down supply chains. I can visualize a Kurzweil world where we would be able to do almost every manufacturing, every aspect of manufacturing on a near shore basis. And the big utilities that we may need, like let us say hydrogen-based power, or solar power, or wind power, or whatever else, would become a portion of a national grid which should be owned by the population so that you don't have uh, the inappropriate controls. You have uh, democratized, governance-driven, public governance-driven controls over these assets which need to be shared by the entire population. And Concurrent with that, we would have a, a complete transformation in supply chains and in technology. So I would say 3D printing, nearshoring, uh, the movement of uh, goods and people by uh, e-vehicles, all of that will be a reality. And we will have a much more purposeful way of life. It's completely so a changed world. It's completely going to be a changed world. So uh, my my next question uh, is for Govind now. Govind, uh, from the funds perspective, uh, what are the forces and pressures on funds which are making them more interested in ESG? So uh, thank you, Ajay, and as always, a pleasure to be on such an eminent panel and to hear the thoughtful comments from everyone. Uh, I think the pressure is coming from multiple you know, sources. And I think at one level, it is, a, it is coming from you, know, you and me, from sort of common people who are asking for more from the corporate sector. When there was a period, especially in the West, of very fast growth, the opportunity cost of focusing on ESG was felt to be too high. That was the period when, you know, sort of Milton Friedman famously stated that, you know, shareholder responsibility was the only res responsibility of companies and so on. As growth has generally slowed, I think uh, the opportunity cost of mindless sort of growth has reduced. And I think there is now a greater, let's say, headroom for companies and investors to start thinking of, you know, what else they should look at. Now, this has also been exacerbated in the recent past by the increase in inequality that you have in many countries. So I think uh, people generally, as well as governments, have started asking questions which were less frequently asked 20 years ago or 25 years ago, questions about whether a corporate sector that is so profitable is actually carrying its weight and whether a corporate sector which is, you know, again, profitable uh, should pursue a either jobless growth, which has which touches on the S part of ESG, or whether it should be damaging the environment. So I think both E and S have come to the fore. And I think a third element, of course, is that science has allowed us and I think nature has shown to us overwhelmingly the impact of, uh, you know, essentially carbon emissions, other forms of emissions, etc. So, you know, 15 years ago, there were still people who questioned the E element of ESG I don't think anybody today really questions it. People may have disagreements on the approach that they take. But this has been 
further sort of compounded by some spectacular governance failures in the recent past. So it is not that there were no governance failures earlier, but the ones in the recent past have been spectacular because of the quality of boards and the hype around those companies before they failed. So, you know, Enron possibly being the poster child of this, but then, you know, you had a whole bunch of them coming around during the dot-com bust many years ago. Then you had in India, you had cases like Satyam. And more recently, you have many, particularly in the financial services space, you know, Divan, uh, ILFS and all, where these issues have started coming up. So I think increasingly people have started realizing that, you know, governance issues are not one out of 1,000 or one out of 500. Actually, every portfolio probably had, you know, 5% or 10% which had serious governance questions. So I think all these three, you know, the E, the S and the G element have started pushing in, in the same direction. Plus, as I said, you know, the, the general, uh, I think, uh, in India Companies Act, but even otherwise, you know, the strengthening of minority shareholders and so on. Finally, and most recently, regulation, I think, has got onto this bandwagon. So uh, whether it is IRDA in India, whether it is PFRDA or in the uh, European Union, whether there are, you know, rules which are guiding how at least public money should be spent. So people are saying that, uh, anything that typically is using monies of the public needs to have some kind of responsibility around it. Uh, in Europe, for instance, pension fund trustees are increasingly being held accountable for at least asking questions. They may finally be useless or ineffective. That's a different point. But the thing is, at least they are told that, look, you should ask questions and, you know, uh, asking questions is useful because if you ask questions, you get an answer and then you still take the wrong decision. You might get sued. So I think that uh, all of these have, uh, uh, you know, come together to push investors and funds to start saying, look, we can't completely ignore ESG. Apart from the point, I think that Tara made earlier, which is there is gradually some correlation between ESG and improved returns. Thanks, Govinda. Uh, very insightful. Uh, Shailaji, continuing with the, on the vision of net zero, I was very curious to understand uh, that uh, how can each entity craft its own journey to go from net zero to net positive and then ultimately gross zero? Uh, you're on mute, Shailaji. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting question because that's a question that's on every board's mind today. And I fully endorse everything Govind said on the forces that are driving us to make these commitments. Quite apart from everything that Govind mentioned, I think there is now a self-realization that if we don't get onto the path of net zero and then net positive and actually save our planet, we may have extremely high penalties to pay some parts of our population are already beginning to pay that penalty in terms of extreme weather events, like there being climate refugees in California or people who were dreading what would happen to the power supply, whether it be restored in Houston or uh, the amazing waves that happened in Canada or on Europe. And particularly in India, the, the kind of temperatures that we saw in some parts of our country. Uh, and therefore, boards are now using double materiality to choose prioritized actions that will change the needle on all of the three aspects of ESNG. What is double materiality? What is happening outside can affect you inside. And what you do inside your company can affect the environment outside. Now you take both these forces into consideration and choose on a priority basis, whether you're going to invest in waste heat recovery or whether you're going to transition from fossil fuel based power to renewables or whether you're going to make a commitment to some aspect of green hydrogen or are you going to get involved in blending of agro waste and other things into your fuel 
in order to reduce the carbon footprint. But the actions are around three big opportunities. One is energy transition. The second is getting into the circular economy and making sure that you don't leave waste to be processed by somebody else in quantities that the world is struggling to actually meet. And therefore we have most of our water bodies polluted with plastic, which is floating around. Uh, and the third aspect is to make sure that human rights are respected in every which way. Now, if you have these choice-making strategic ideas, then you're practicing good governance. You are placing your bets on things that you can change the needle on, which will get you to net zero. And then companies like Infosys, which are already net zero, are thinking of becoming net positive. So what they are saying is that we will go into the entire carbon footprint that happened from the time of our birth, and we will reverse that as well. And that's the approach to net positive. And the gross zero idea is that you do not take any strategic action at all, which will cause a carbon footprint or will cause a uh, requirement to push more into landfills, which are already overflowing and which are large emitters of methane, which was slated in COP26 as another gas that we needed to make sure that we reversed our footprint on. So I'll stop there. There's a, there's a whole wide spectrum of ideas surrounding this. But there is what are called the three scopes. One is what you do internally. One second scope is what you do with your outsourced suppliers. Third is with your whole value chain. Fourth is with your whole domain, the whole industry. Fifth is with the entire country. And sixth is with the whole world. So these are the six scopes of your choices. And that sounds perfect. I, I, I'm sure it, uh, um, even 12 hours will not be enough to understand them in detail. But for uh, getting, the, getting people to think, I think these pointers are enough for people to uh, move on that path, at least start. So uh, Akansha, I have a question for you. Uh, you are on the corporate side of it and you practice ESG. Uh, how are ESG indexes institutionalizing the sustainable investment? Uh, it's a very relevant question because um, I feel that the pandemic induced disruptions have forced um, both investors and corporates to look at ESG risk uh, with a very different perspective. Uh, we have seen that in the recent months, um, how the ESG funding worldwide has uh, seen unprecedented growth. Uh, you know, there are estimates that globally ESG assets are on their way to exceed $50 trillion by 2025. So this is indeed good news for all those who are demanding more transparent and inclusive uh, business operations. However, proliferation of ESG reporting by corporates and also research methodologies, ESG scoring systems, ratings, all of these call for much greater institutionalization of for sustainable investment. So, you know, ESG based indexes like DGSI, FTSE, Ecovadis, these all are benchmarks that help define ESG asset market ecosystem around sustainable investing. And there has been a logical follow up to the explosion of sustainability data that has led to, you know, ESG ratings and then a simulation of ratings into such indexes. But the fact is that the ind these indexes also act as performance yardsticks for many passive investment funds like EDFs and other large pension funds. And they define tangents for meeting specific ESG criteria and standard of such characteristics to be used by asset managers to compare asset class with the market uh, underlying market performance. So I think the rise of ESG indexes will definitely be a very, very favorable step in bringing more standardization and mainstreaming the investment decision-making culture. So more, I would like to answer this from a cultural and evolution perspective of the entire ESG landscape, that it will be a very, very uh, defining and milestone driven journey for, for the entire ecosystem. Very insightful. 
Tara, I want to ask you, uh, you uh, are consulting companies on the ESG and also have uh, building up a platform. Do you think impact investing has a potential to drive and deliver sustainable development goals? <clears throat> So United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, they're like global goals for humanity, right? It has been signed up by 193 countries. Yeah. Um, this is basically goals to deliver the universal basic services and universal basic uh, income for every global citizen. As Shalitza was saying, just having clean water and tap and the clean air are some of the leading goals in this SDG, right? So we are calculating a big social gap, which needs to be delivered by all the global countries by 2030. Now let's look at what is impact investing. So on impact investing, when the private capital is deployed to meet the social gap, that becomes an impact investment. And if we put together these two, I would look at it as SDG is the lock and impact investment is the key to open it, in fact. And this is very true. Because India today stands at 120th position in reaching the SDG. And out of the 193 countries, we are ranked at 120th. And we have about, our budget is about 2.67 trillion up until 2030 to meet these goals for us. Out of this, 1.12 trillion is open for private investment. So private investment, it has to meet three criteria. Number one, it has to be, when you say impact investment, it has to meet, it has to have an intentionality, which means it must deliver a specific positive measurable outcome. Number two, it must enable access to quality services and products to the most undeserved, underserved communities. And number three, it has to be commercially viable and scalable so that there is a business case for private investments to happen. So if we put these together, I would say that if the ecosystem is built, and if the opportunities are packaged in such a way that the investors can consume to it more easily, and the governance is put in place where there is this roadmap that outcome created can be tagged and mapped to our target achievement of our national SDGs. There is definitely an if the a market rate or above market rate return is very much, all of these are very much possible. If these may be the pieces of the puzzle we need to put together to make this happen, but absolutely, Govind, it was a very interesting uh, to listen to from an uh, investor perspective how we look at ESG. And even I, I would strongly believe that investor community plus technology and the government, if these three dimensions come together, we absolutely have the power to deliver our SDGs with the lever of impact investing. Uh, that's wonderful to hear that. Now, I would like to ask Govind, uh, Govind, how exactly are funds acting to influence ESG in the companies they are investing in? Uh, you're on mute, Govind. Yeah, thank you, Ajit. So let me try to respond uh, by articulating the range of tools that investors use to, uh, to influence ESG. There are uh, what I would call three old fashioned tools and one new tool. The oldest fashion tool and best understand and understood in the West is voting. Because, you know, those are strongly legal countries. They only believe really that, you know, if you vote, you can, you can vote against the company or the management. The downside of that is uh, voting either in a, in a meeting or voting with your feet, namely selling the shares, does not sort of solve the problems of the world. It only solves the problems of that fund getting out of something as such. Perhaps in the very long term, it may help. The second approach, which I think has is used even today with some success, is slightly greater activism. So you have activist shareholders in different parts of the world, but largely in the US where you know people will effectively take shots at management and seek to publicly influence them by writing letters and putting articles and saying how the strategy needs to change etc sometimes this is done with a genuine esg motivation sometimes it is done only for their own returns but let us give the benefit of the doubt to the investor and say it is done for an esg motivation it works to some extent i would say that maybe in 
20-25% of cases it works, but very often managements are also powerful and able to push back. More importantly, it doesn't work in certain, certain cultural milieus. So, you know, in a milieu like India, where promoters own 40 or 50% of the company, a company stake, they don't need to listen to investors really. Uh, if, if investors are bullying them, you need to sort of treat them slightly differently. In Japan, for instance, quite ineffective. And the, uh, uh, I think the, uh, the third mechanism, which I think Tara referred to is exclusion, which is an old way of dealing with it, which is they will not invest in, you know, armament, armaments and, you know, companies which are damaging the climate and all that can be effective to some extent because I think, uh, you know, the Norwegian pension fund, for instance, notably goes and uh, excludes a lot of companies. But all these, I think, are limited and there is a fourth approach which is now becoming more popular, which is what I would call ESG stewards, where the investor is going to have to hire a separate uh, skill set of people, typically operating managers who have run large companies and have credibility use those managers to deal with promoters, boards of directors, auditors, lenders, other funds, etc., and continue engagement over a period of one to two years. Because these ESG issues do not get sorted out immediately. So if you take, let's say, an air conditioning company, which has to move from three-star to five-star AC, it sounds like a you know climate-focused thing, but it's also part of strategy. Because and, and therefore, you have to have capital expenditure decisions and so on. If you take a bank which is currently lending brown and has to move, move towards green, it's again a strategic choice. You know, there are credit choices that they have to understand. There are operational changes they have to make and so on. So it takes some time to, to, to do this. But if in, investors, therefore, have to speak to promoters and managements, demonstrate to them the risks and rewards of you know, doing this, in a sense, hold their hand, sometimes provide advice. In many cases, it is good to show people, you know, to bring to the board, etc., people who have already done this elsewhere. Now, that engagement is tough. You move away from investment, which is usually all about sort of finance and ideas, and move into management, which is not the strong suit of most investors, investing professionals. But I think that is the direction in which investing is going. So to different extents, different funds will have to build this skill set and then bring that uh, to the table. ESG stewardship. Perfect. Uh, Shailiji, what are the enablers uh, which you think will help this journey from net zero uh, to gross zero? Uh, so three critical enablers, one which Thara already dealt with quite fully, the SDGs they become the bedrock, which will enable you to think through what you need to do. And to help me to do that, I use a glass to drink my water from, which has the 17 SDGs all around them. So I'm reminded every time I drink a sip of water, what I need to do. But uh, so I think that's one. The second is what Akanksha referred to as standards. Now there, we are very fortunate that the world established what is called the uh, International Sus Sustainability Standards Board under the IASP in London. And what the ISSP is going to do is just like we have accounting standards, they will set up standards for sustainability measurement and reporting. So that if all of us report along using the same standards, then it will mean the same thing if a particular action is taken. And there will be much more credibility in the reports that people put out. Quite apart from that, the Value Reporting Foundation was established in New York last year, which saw the amalgamation of integrated reporting and SASP. What this did is it has given a framework to the whole world. One option, GRI is the other framework which is still very active. And there are variations on the theme, 
Tara is an expert on that, so she can comment more. But uh, I'm saying that the value reporting foundation will provide the framework that all of us in corporate India need to use to report systematically and consistently and in a manner that all our outputs can be compared across. So we will have the enabler of frameworks, the enabler of standards, and the enabler of the 17 SDGs. Now, all of this can be put onto platforms, can be moved into databases of individual occasions when input output ratios are or data sets if you like and you could think about in five years time an ERP of ESG which will blockchain the measures so that nobody can fiddle with it you don't come to the end of the year and say oh, now let me show that I've got a little more done on my net zero commitment than what I've actually done so all of this can be prevented and there will be a set of people who will provide additional value to what is reported. So it could be an accounting firm, it could be a consulting firm, it could be anybody who has credibility and can add value to what is being reported. So this is the way the world is emerging in, uh, in terms of having consistent and comparable ratings. Yes, that, that's perfect. Uh, Akansha, you remember we were speaking about AI and data. Uh, can you uh, put some light on what role do you see the artificial intelligence and data uh, will play for this change? Uh, see, we live in a world where data and carbon have emerged as the two new currencies. And as sustainability investments are gaining steam worldwide, investment managers are under sort of unprecedented demand, I would say, if not pressure, to measure the ESG compliances of various portfolios. But it is a lack of data that makes it a really tall order to assess long-term risk and rewards. And therefore, I think uh, creating a framework level leveraging technology, leveraging artificial intelligence solutions that would help in bridging that data divide and the data gaps would act as a very big catalyst in the sustainable investing um, you know, system at scale. And I think uh, artificial intelligence also would create you know, it, uh, algorithms that really support uh, ESG analysis, which, is, which could be real time and also raise early warnings and appropriate gadgets to identify uh, various trends precisely to, to look at companies' activities and can also capture consumer sentiment. So I think in totality, tech, AI solutions, data practices would play a very big role, not just on, on this part, but also on uh, investment bankers and portfolio managers. And also they could uh, bypass a lot of labor intensive work that they invest in doing research and provide a ready to offer solution to various individuals and institutions. So I think it is emerging, but we need more evolved products and solutions in this space but it would be definitely a game changer. Perfect. Uh, Thara, uh, we are hearing about cryptocurrencies and impact to tokens for social good. Are they for real? How fast do you think they are approaching? So the very first time anybody looks at cryptocurrency or blockchain technology through the lens of sustainability, the very first things that you would see and hear are that these, this is not an environmentally sustainable technology due to the massive emission that it causes, which is, which is true, which was true, which used to be true. And the blockchain industry alone is emitting as heavy emissions as much as the Netherlands, as a country as Netherlands. But then the underlying technology is changing. There are solutions that are falling in place to reduce the emission. And while this is happening, if, let's keep it aside that this is definitely going to get addressed in the due course of time. But if we keep that aside and take a look at the very design of this technology, we can see that it is designed to deliver sustainable outcomes. 
first of all, we talk about decentralized. It is decentralized, right? The authority and control is not with what one place and it is, it is decentralized. It is with multiple groups, which is what is most required for the financial inclusion. Number two, it is immutable. Once done, it cannot be undone and without the consensus and it cannot be undone and it has to be seen, it can be seen by everybody, which is what the toppest level of governance that we can see. And technically, blockchain is still the most secured, one of the most secured networks that we can have and which is increasing the, increasing the trustworthiness of the transactions or the contracts behind it, right? So logically, this is very much us, this technology is designed to deliver sustainable outcomes. But is it actually this technology is being leveraged to deliver that kind of a social outcome and output? Definitely, yes. United Nations, the World uh, Food Program, you know, which is meant to deliver supplies to the refugees across the globe. It is, it is done on a blockchain platform, wherein the refugees can walk into the store and get their supplies just by the scanning of their iris. And these are people who do not have a single documentation for their identity validation or a bank account, wherein the, the, this is the kind of reach and financial inclusion that blockchain technology can enable, directly delivering into the hands of the needed. So, you know, removing the entire intermediaries. So several such government-enabled programs are coming on blockchain to deliver the social outcome impacts. Several such uh, uh, programs are coming. There's one called uh, Fishcoin, which is meant to improve the livelihood of fishermen. And there's one that I'm recently looked up, Empova, which is meant to develop affordable homes for Africa, where at least 80% of the population do not own a house, and the mortgage rates are as high as 34%. And globally, investors can invest into it, directly delivering into the hands of the needed, complete elimination of the central layer and in a most safe and secured way. So this is what blockchain can definitely enable. So the technology has to get stabilized, the governance has to fall in place, the governmental roles and all these confusions have to get clarified, sorted out. We'll have the, all those hurdles, but blockchain and cryptocurrency as a technology, it definitely has the ability to deliver the social impacts at a scale in a very secured and safe manner in a, in a way that no other technology can do. So this is definitely yeah. happening. It's just a matter of time. We will see more and more use cases in the social life. So it is real and it is happening and approaching. So uh, good to know this, uh, Tara. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, people joining from the next session also, but uh, I know we are short of time. But uh, as I said at the inception of this discussion, uh, even 10 hours will not be enough for this session. But I, uh, before we actually open the Q&As, I have two curious questions in my mind uh, for you, Govind, and I'll ask both of them uh, together. Uh, see, I, we are, uh, as is the platform is of alternate investment fund platform, uh, I want to understand what is the financial or return-based benefit to funds of the, which are of ESG focused. And also, uh, I need to understand that what is the difference uh, uh, between the private equity funds and public investing funds, how are they responding to ESG? Yeah, thanks, uh, Ajay. So let me respond to your first question. Uh, as uh, again, I think Tara mentioned earlier, there is a lot of, there is a body of work that is coming out now, which is showing that there's a correlation between companies which have higher ESG scores and higher investment returns. Now, there are two reasons for it. One reason, of course, is companies which are anyway successful have the luxury of also being uh, ESG compliant. So, you know, uh, we used to see this in the Tata system when I was there, which is that companies which are successful are also the ones which have better safety records because they just can spend more time on focusing on health and safety and so on. So I think that th that's one reason. But then the other and much more important reason is that, uh, you know, these, uh, there is indeed a improvement in return for different reasons, you know, for, and there are different causes. First is ESD at, at, at one level is a risk mitigant. So to take uh, and these risks are not only the obvious risks of, you know, uh, climate damage to your own company or something like that, but the risks of missing changes that are taking place in the rest of the world. So, 
for instance, a auto company today which doesn't care about electric vehicles is missing a big trend. So, uh, you know, I think that those who are ESG focused are therefore taking away a lot of downside risk. And that's why you have higher returns. So professors like George Serafim at Harvard, for instance, have done a lot of work of, uh, you know, which shows ESG working under different scenarios in Asia, in the US, with large companies, with small companies, private investors, public investors, and so on. So the, the returns are clearly much higher. There are also very real impacts. So for instance, in a world which is dominated by social media and public opinion, if you're going to, uh, you get caught out a lot faster for things that, uh, you know, errors of omission or errors of commission. And you, know, you tend to sort of face some significant flack for that. So I think, again, companies have started focusing on all of these things a lot more. Your second question on private versus public, uh, you know, in theory, there should be no difference between whether you're a public investor or a private equity investor. But in practice, private equity investors have a much greater line of sight on the companies that they're dealing with because they make the investments directly and they are Usually, they have access to the, uh, they are the owners in some ways, and they have access to the uh, founding team or the management all the time. So they can and they do influence uh, usually better standards of ESG than in the uh, pub public investment sort of domain. This is contrary to what many people feel. Many people feel that private equity is ruthless and they tend to sort of fire people and all that. But I think that by and large, ESG standards are quite high, in part because you know, you can attribute negligence also very directly in the part in, in private markets. In public markets, I think uh, it's more difficult to do because uh, usually you own a small percentage of a company. You don't have direct access to management always. Information is not shared correctly saying that it's insider information. You can't share it with only one investor and so on. So in the public markets, you tend to have some difference. Having said which, in the public markets, if somebody, if an investor highlights an issue, it becomes, it gets a lot more publicity and therefore there is pressure on management. Ajay, uh, can I just come in here? Yeah, I, I'm just inviting you now, Aditya, please. Come. <laughs> really out of time. engrossing discussion. So, yeah, 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 it has been, but uh, we have some back-to-back -back sessions lined up. So it'll yes. be difficult for us to continue anymore. And unfortunately, we'll not be able to take any audience questions also right now. Uh, we'll really overrun the time. Uh, but any, I mean, uh, quickly, if you want to uh, sum up with your panelists for the next couple of minutes, I think uh, we can wind up that way. I think to, uh, to sum up, uh, I would like to ask Shailaji, if he is work, you're working with so many companies which are practicing ASG, uh, tell us what will make the organizations realize that commitment is genuine and out of love for our planet. How can we do that? Absolutely. And I think the best route for that is to include every person in your company in the ESG strategy. To me, if you can have a 30-week plan for each human being in your company, giving them simple thoughts of what they can do to change the needle, I think that is the most powerful thought I'd like to leave behind for everybody listening in. And then it's a matter of cascading upward and downward those commitments and making sure that you continually remain conscious about having to change the needle. Change the needle, get committed, take the actions, report them faithfully, correctly. And Thank it's you. happening. It is happening. It's happening in a big way. Big way. Big way. Thank you everyone for your inputs and joining. There, there, are, there are a lot many questions more. Aditya, uh, I would suggest if you get any questions from the QA, uh, from the participants, later we can collate them and ask them from so the happy. panel separately and share to those people. <laughs> happy to. Up uh, you said it correctly in the beginning. It uh, requires much more time, Ajay. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, you get a good job. Thank you so much, Ajay, Tara, uh, Akank Akanksha, and Govind. Uh, uh, Shailesh, sir, I'll not thank you. I just always keep seeking your blessings because <laughs> you've been someone uh, we've always looked up to. And uh, it's so wonderful to have you here in the panel uh, again with us today. So uh, thank you. I, I, I know, I mean, the, the sheer focus, uh, uh, and I, I was talking about this, uh, Shailesh, sir, before uh, I've had the privilege of 
working closely with you over the last 10 to 12 years and watching you very very closely and uh, at the sheer focus uh, you are now putting on esg over the last few years uh, tells me that you know this is where the world is moving next so i have always been uh, uh, you know uh, following your footsteps and i'm sure uh, uh, investment circles also yes we do the same uh, uh hoping to catch up with all of you soon uh, i i and we're seriously hoping that this is last of our virtual sessions uh, a topic like this yeah. definitely is a better audience a be- better <laughs> more elaborate discussion and a more in person meeting uh, definitely we are putting that up soon so take care everyone thank you so much for joining thank you so much thanks everyone all the best thank, thank you ajay for thank doing you. all the hard work coordinating all of us <laughs>